Hello, Ricky and Christoph. Uh, how are you both? Thank you so much for taking time uh, to chat with us. And as you well know, we're recording this conversation for sharing at Field Experiments, a special section dedicated to experimental film as part of the, our Painting with Light uh, Film Festival. And so uh, we'd like to also introduce you uh, to the audience. Yes, so uh, with us here today is Mr. Christoph Janetsko, an internationally active German film director, cameraman, film editor, and film lecturer. He is considered one of the key representatives of German experimental film of the post-iconic era and was one of the first German experimental filmmakers to appreciate and consistently use digital possibilities. His experimental short films have been shown at numerous national and international festivals in Germany, France, the United States, and Japan, among others. Since 1982, Janetsko has been teaching short film, camera, lighting, and post-production at the University of Fine Arts Braunschweig and Hamburg Media School, and at times also at the Berlin University of the Arts and Bauhaus University Weimar. He has taught seminars and workshops for the Goethe Institute with a focus on North and South America and Southeast Asia. Clarissa, over to you to introduce Ricky. Yeah, so uh, Ricky Aureliana is currently the director and audiovisual archive head at MOA Fund and the corporate secretary of the Animation Council of the Philippines and a board member of the Society of Filipino Archivists for Film as well as a member of the Southeast Asia Pacific Audiovisual Archive Association. He has worked variously as director, animator, film editor, sound recordist, and art director on short and feature films, documentaries, including directing the documentary film on Philippine national artist Arturo Luis. He began to make films while studying architecture at the University of Santo Tomas, and made experimental films at the Goethe Institute and Moofan workshop by German filmmaker uh, Christoph Janetsko, who is with us today. Um, some of these films have been included in this film program, Same Nila, and the animation for Girl at Bikini Island. Thank you, Clarissa. And perhaps we could have Christoph and um, Ricky also start by telling us how you are and where you're speaking to us from. Uh, I'm all right. Not, not much. Wait, do they, okay, I'm all right. Not much to say. And I am now here in Berlin, in Karl, Berlin, Karlshorst. And um, there is not much to say. It's summertime and uh, finally after long uh, winter. And uh, just looking forward for, you know, for better times everywhere <laughs> after the long pandemic. Great. Ricky? Hi. Um, yeah, uh, I'm here in Manila right now. It's already uh, 5.39 p.m., so um, it's nearing uh, evening. Well, right now I'm uh, feeling fine, uh, despite the, what happened, you know, a few days ago. <laughs> so uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you've uh, invited me for this uh, dialogue with Christophe. So, I mean, I'd like to start off by asking uh, Christoph uh, a question. So, Christoph, um, could you describe the ob objectives of the 16 millimeter filmmaking workshops that you did in Manila and in Bangkok? Like, how did the circumstances of these workshops um, that, the, that you did in these places um, differ? And how were well, they the same? Yeah, they, they differ actually quite a lot, I must say. First of all, in Manila, uh, there was already a basic ground uh, of filmmaking in every area. Uh, it was in the 80s and uh, the Philippines has been, as everybody knows, the most prolific and most active uh, country in Southeast Asia in film production up to 200 movies a year, which is amazing. So there was, first of all, a background in the film industry also, there were a lot of, um, I must say, really a lot of incredibly talented young filmmakers hungry to make films. And 
the most important they were already experienced in experimental film. Ricky knows it better because there had been a lot of workshops with the Mole Fund. And thanks to the Mole Fund, I must say, uh, they, good, uh, they, they had a very good educational program supporting, in particular, young filmmakers to develop certain kind of skills. And um, so when I arrived in Manila, there was already a very good starting base because all of them, I think not all, but most of them had already some kind of experience in uh, filmmaking and also in experimental films. Because before I arrived, there had been a few people, I think like Ingo Petzko, uh, and some others who already did workshops on um, at the Mole Fund on experimental films. Then there had been cinematography workshops also, and so on. But also the circumstances, uh, just to cut the story short, that um, this particular um, background of uh, in Manila of filmmaking, that there was also another very lucky uh, circumstances that there was a director, Dr. Uwe Schmelter, who has seen the huge talent in, um, in film making in the Philippines. And he told me, you know what, this is incredible what these people do here in the Philippines when I arrived at the first time. He is a musician actually, and he could, I mean, he's a con conductor and violin uh, player and so on. But he said, this is more important. We have to support the film industry. And he really, really strongly supported the, and, uh, the, uh, the mobile fund. And he was actually, it was a good, very good combination, Dr. Uwe Schmelter and the Mole Fund. So I don't know, Ricky has a different perspective of it, but I think he, because he knows also the other workshops. So this was one thing. And the other, the Mole Fund was something unique at that time, maybe until today, I'm not so sure I've been there a long time, but it was something you need, which I never ever experienced anywhere in Southeast Asia, because the Mole Fund was a place where people could, you know, could go, just hang out, watch films, talk to each other. There was a small, basic, very basic restaurants where you could, a restaurant, it was very cheap and it, um, you could have a little food and you could have a wonderful ice cold San Miguel beer, sit down in the garden and talk about um, the movies. And that, that atmosphere I never ever found before. And let me just say one more thing to that, that the workshop took place at the time where major change, political changes happened just a year or two years before I arrived, and this is the Etza revolution. This was very important because there was a spirit of, uh, you know, of liberation. There was still the spirit of a revolution with the filmmaker. I could realize it because after such a long time of martial law uh, and suppression and no freedom of expression, suddenly they got you know, the, they were set in the situation where they could do everything. Had the Mole Fund, had some support by the Goethe Institute. And uh, this was also very important, the spirit. And this was, and I was surprised because my concept is always not to tell the people what, what, what kind of film they like to do. I expose them to experimental films, try to inspire them for creativity. This is my main, my main concentration that I, you know, I, that, that they really find their own personal language. And because this is what experimental film is. Experimental film is an artistic form. And with an artistic form, you can reach the people to find their own personal expression in filmmaking. And that actually happened, happened in, uh, in Manila very fast. And uh, so I was then surprised that so many films, experimental films had been made with political issues. Amazing. I mean, I never told them what they do. It's up really the, because of this, this is, I, I, I don't think it's good to make a workshop on a topic or something like this because it doesn't support the, um, the creativity of personality. Experimental film is of course, um, you know, once again, 
to find yourself and find your own way of making films. But I think that that was also quite surprising. And I saw, I saw also after the workshop was finished and was the films had been sun, sent all around the world and got even some prizes. Uh, they, I think, I mean, Ricky knows that much better, but they had been shown at many festivals worldwide. And also many people were surprised about the combination of creativity, storytelling and political issue Thank you so much, Christoph. I mean, I think it, it really is a, a treasure trove of very vivid and visceral experiences, you know, from the equipment to the, to the approaches uh, that are being um, surfaced and also experimented with, you know, through filmmakers like Ricky. So we wanted to ask Ricky now as also a, a, someone who experienced this process firsthand um, that, you know, reflecting on your film, South Manila now, how has your perspective on the documentary form changed since? Because you've been involved in so many different types and aspects of film production. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, probably I'll start first with the, during our workshop with Christoph. Uh, yes. Actually, we were three in a group, um, myself, mm -hmm. Uh, Josephine Achenza and Mike Altazaren. So mm -hmm. we were discussing what we, we are going to present to Christoph because uh, Christoph uh, actually uh, encouraged us to do some pre-production. Uh, so there's there's a really a schedule, a day wherein we will <laughs> present to him what we have, uh, you know, uh, come up. And... Um, we were focusing more on the technical aspect and uh, more on the experimental aspect of the film. We were not really uh, uh, documentaries, you know, mm -hmm. um, not there. Yeah. So uh, at first, I, I don't know if Christophe remembered it, I remember this. Uh, we presented a our first draft of proposal. It's about this uh, person who went up uh, a tall building and he jumped uh, on top of the building. And during his fall, he has these flashes of uh, images. And oh. <laughs> after our consultation with Christoph, he said, what's the motivation? So <laughs> we were kind of stunned because... Uh, uh, we cannot answer him. <laughs> so we, we quickly change our ideas and focus more on the flashes of images. And uh, I guess I can also relate this to uh, images that I remembered. Uh, this was before Moel Fan. Mm. I was very young and I was watching this... Uh, Oscars because I, I I love watching Oscars uh, <laughs> uh, on television and they have this uh, particular tribute to experimental films mm -hmm. and one of the films that they uh, featured or they, they got a clip is uh, I, I soon found out it's uh, New York New York by Francis Thompson mm -hmm. and this particular scene about this car reflected on a distorted uh, mirror fascinated me. So when we were discussing, I mean, going back to our, our plan, mm -hmm. when we were discussing about uh, what we wanted to do about those images, uh, suddenly it dawned upon me that, hey, let, let's shoot around Manila with, uh, you know, images reflected on uh, distorted uh, or fragmented uh, image, uh, mirrors, uh, probably distorted uh, reflections. Mm. So that's that's how it started. And uh, we shot it on video first. Yeah. So we so we presented it again to 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 Christoph. Yeah. So for him to check our progress. And when he viewed the images, he's he told us, uh, 
don't make it uh, I don't know Christoph what's your term it's, <laughs> what I remember is uh, it's uh, okay. touristy <laughs> meaning uh, make it more make it more abstract take it from a different uh, vantage point avoid landmarks <laughs> it, it's going to be a, a tourist film so again we we took note of that and when the time came that we were already going to shoot the film um and and uh we had three days to shoot to shoot all we want mm. uh, so we went uh to manila particularly around manila uh we woke up very early because uh uh we we used uh, Josephine Atienza's car to go to Manila <laughs> and park there. So it was raining during that time, I remember. And, uh, and, and there's this news. I don't know if uh, uh, Lisa can remember this. Uh, there was a time during the 80s that people were afraid to go out to uh, BC streets, particularly in Manila, because there's a news about this uh, a person who uh, throws acid on your face. Oh so my we gosh. were we were quite um, uh, we were scared actually while when, while we were shooting. We're not we're not scared of uh, the police because it's a guerrilla shoot, but we were more afraid of that person. <laughs> encountering that person so uh we, we finished it uh so we we went back again to shoot another you know a couple of uh of uh footage and one particular shoot uh we we did this uh using the mobile fun swimming pool wherein we catch a rat and uh, oh, yeah, we yeah, released yeah. it in the empty <laughs> swimming pool and we chased it by using, using the 16 millimeter EBM camera. Bangkok was totally different. Bangkok had zero, almost zero in film production, totally different. I mean, in the 80s, still in, in the Philippines, 200 feature films have been made in, uh, in, and there was in that time when I arrived in Bangkok, it was almost zero. I forgot the name who is the, the only director who is part of the King family. I'm sorry, I forgot that name, who did a few films, but there was not, not much happening. There was no exposure in experimental film. And the first time I was in 88 in, uh, in Bangkok and did a seminar on experimental film, it was overwhelming. Actually, people never seen this kind of films. There were a lot of people in the, in, in the, in the, um, in the cinemas. And uh, so, you know, the, I explained, tried to explain what we did, blah, blah, blah. But uh, a year later, uh, we did the first, uh, uh, yeah, first workshop on experimental film, and it was actually very good. There were a lot of talented people with no experience, mm. and it was amazing how they got into it and how, how they really understood, very fast understood uh, the essence of experimental film. And... Uh, like Pippa Catovira or Manit and so mm. on. And also quite interested, interesting is I think maybe I think that there were a little bit because I brought the films from Manila from the first workshop. The workshop in Bangkok happened a year later. And uh, I could show all the films there at that time. So um, so I think they were exposed. I think they were inspired by the by the films, uh, by the workshop films, uh, which yeah. we made a year before at Mandela. Definitely had been quite inspired. It was certainly an exciting time then. And, you know, some will say that maybe the next exciting moment is actually now. So um, this, this question is, you know, for Crystal, because like, I'd say there are like concerns that their, you know, appreciation and knowledge of like analog film are fading. 
but you know you yourself you know you're very excited about the possibilities of like digital video and you know why do you think you know video is so exciting for experimental filmmaking and you know we're exposed you know today to so many videos online you know what do you think makes a good experimental video now you know where do you think experimental filmmaking is at and you know where do you think it's going it's going as uh, usual it's going to personal storytelling to personal storytelling uh, nothing changed actually um experimental film is what it is what it is for me from my point of view that uh the the artistic the artistic um and aesthetic uh, expression is the main focus, whatever the topic is and whatever the story is. And every film is a story, has a story. And, and until now, I think creativity has no limit. Circumstances change, time has changed, focus on certain issues has totally changed. Um, I mean, I'm not really so excited about digital media. I just take it as it is. It came up and... Um, and for me, uh, six, nothing against analog film, but uh, you are more dependent on laboratories. You are more dependent on film negatives, which have became more and more expensive. You are dependent on really huge cameras. And I think um, um, uh, in the 90s with digital video, when uh, the first digital vi video uh, arrived and uh, in the dogma film, I think the dogma film was really started the big change in, in Denmark with uh, Winterberg and uh, many other and the last one, Trier and so on, uh, where uh, they had the idea, let's be, let's be independent, let's do films spontaneously, the spontaneity, you don't have to go to the laboratory, you don't have to wait to the rushes, you don't have to have so much money, you can shoot on location, look at the footage, reshoot it again, and mm -hmm. so on. And that, that was really a major, major boost. And I thought that was a 95. And um, since then, the digital technology started slowly to develop. It took some time. And then I'm, uh, I thought, uh, I, you know, I, I like to make films and I like to make films and be independent. So it's a combination being an ind independent filmmaker and doing my personal films without budgets or without limits. And that is what digital uh, film uh, allows. It is now it is brilliant. It is, it is a, really, you can, you can get small cameras with, amazing quality uh, you have post-production you can do the complete workflow post-production workflow on on a laptop mm -hmm. it doesn't go easier so uh, i think this is for me my my personal advantage and i think experimental with experimental film uh, in with digital media i think has a bit more potential if it's if it's really well uh, organized. That's the problem mm -hmm. is with digital technology, people get it and they shoot around and shoot this and this because it's so easy, it's so cheap. Yeah. And uh, they don't think about concepts. At the end, an experimental film is basically, uh, uh, it's the concept, the idea and the concept. I think um, that's all the time we have for today, but we're looking forward to continuing the conversation offline yes. and hopefully at the colloquium as well, which we are organizing to happen in 2022. So thank you so much again, Ricky and Christoph. Um, yes, for thank, you. thank you. Thank for you for your invitation. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.